So I'll begin in Luke chapter number 6. Some weeks ago, we looked at the calling of the apostles, the choosing of the apostles from the number of disciples that were following Jesus. In Luke chapter number 6, we continue our journey, but uh, we're going to look in particular again at Peter today. While you're finding your place in Luke chapter number 6, it, it's amazing to me to see what God does. And uh, Brother Josh, uh, last week, last Sunday morning, if you were here, Brother Josh Monitor came from Treasure Mountain Revival. And uh, I spoke with him uh, the day after, and I said, Brother Josh, uh, were you pilfering my notes or something? Uh, did, did you uh, know that, uh, you know, last Sunday, meaning two Sundays ago, that I had begun a series on, uh, and starting with Peter, looking at Jesus' disciples? And he had no idea, but uh, his wife had figured it out because she found my notes in the back, my little outline that I give for you to do Bible studies, and just give you a starting point there to go dig a little deeper, maybe have some discussions with others around those things, you know, on what the preacher preached on on Sunday. Sometimes that's good to just get, a, get get some coffee together with other believers and say, hey, you know, let's go over Sunday sermon and let's, uh, you know, please uh, be kind to me. There's plenty of things that you can find that are wrong with me, but that's not the intent of what I'd want you to do to get, get in the Word together and say, you know, pastor was talking about this. Let's unpack it a little deeper. He gave us this little outline. Let's see what he was thinking. Let's, let's, let's track these thoughts and, and uh, see what, what greater study we can do because, uh, I mean, let's face it, to have uh, 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, hour and a half, three hours, if you'll give it to me. No, no takers on that. Okay, well, I thought I'd try uh, to be able to open the Word of God with you on Sunday morning. Uh, that, that's a fairly limited time. And there's a lot that goes into these studies. And I just want to encourage you, uh, use those as tools to help you in your spiritual growth. And uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. But we began that journey and the Lord, uh, the Lord led Brother Josh to to preach on Peter last week, of all people. So you got that in a synopsis. So we're going to look uh, in detail at uh, Peter today again, Lord willing. And as we look at Luke chapter number 6, I'm going to just read uh, where Jesus spent all night in prayer before He selected His disciples, uh, selected His apostles, I should say. And then we'll go from there. In Luke chapter number 6, we read in verse number 12, it came to pass in those days, we know what those days were, mounting opposition to Jesus Christ from the religious leaders, the establishment, if you will, at that time, that he went out into a mountain to pray. There's a, there's a big reason why, because they have rejected him and the offer that he has come to be their Messiah and fulfill the promises that were given to David and the religious leaders on behalf of Israel have rejected that. And so now Jesus needs to pray and he wants to bathe this uh, in prayer, communing uh, with the Father. As they're communing to, to put Him to death in verse 11, He's communing with the Father in prayer on the mountain all night. He continued all night in prayer to God. This is a detail unique to Luke, as we've mentioned. But verse number 13, the night has expired. When it was day, He called, He called unto Him, His disciples, all of them. And of them, His disciples... He chose 12. There's a calling and there's a choosing. And election, if you will. This is election season. And if you're like me, if you got on some of these numbers around here, maybe you didn't intend to. You wind up with about 10 or a dozen uh, text messages or phone calls, you know, po political candidates and all of this. Well, this is a little bit of a different kind of election. This is the Lord Jesus choosing those who will become the leaders uh, in, uh, in the early church. One of them, mindful of that, he is a betrayer. We know who Judas Iscariot is. So uh, he called unto him his disciples. Of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Calling, choosing, naming. Jesus is doing something profound here. Now verse number 14, we read Simon and Andrew. Simon. He starts with Simon, but there's a parenthesis. This isn't just any Simon. This is the Simon. This is the Simon, Luke tells us, whom he also named Peter. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we continue to look at Peter today, his call that you had given him, his choosing, and help us to learn from him and to grow in your grace and knowledge as he would have us to do. It's a humble thing that I do here to approach uh, trying to give your word 
and to expound it this morning. And I, I lean upon you, Lord. I pray that you will take your scriptures and help us to see what it is that the Spirit would have for us. May we have ears to hear, and may you grow the church spiritually, and uh, Lord, meet our needs through the preaching and teaching of your word this hour. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've been pursuing uh, Peter, Simon, he's surnamed Peter, Mark 3.16. Uh, Jesus gave this call to Peter, and it was a call that would require total commitment and self-denial. So notice with me in Luke chapter number 5, turn back to chapter number 5, and maybe recall uh, some time ago we exposited these passages together, but I just want to remind ourselves of verses 1 through 11 where we see Peter's call to discipleship. So I'm kind of working in reverse, and I hope you'll see where I'm going with this. We have the call, the choosing to be an apostle. In chapter number 5, verses 1 through 11, we have the call to be a fisher of men. And Jesus invited Peter here, and we notice, uh, first off, his partial obedience. And we note that in verses 1 through 7, Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, Jesus, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, we know that's the lake of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was... Whose was it? <laughs> Simon's. That Simon. Yes, the same Simon in Luke 6, uh, verse number 13 and 14. That Simon. The Simon he had surnamed Peter. But we're not told that here. We're just told that this is Simon's ship. One of the ships, which was Simon's. Out of the two he could have chosen, he selected that ship. Simon's ship to teach from. And he prayed him, he asked uh, Simon, if you will, that he would thrust out a little from the land. He's going to use that as an amphitheater. And he sat down, took the posture of a teacher in this day, sat down and taught the people out of the ship. I wonder what that message was. I wonder what lesson that would have been. Oh, to sit on the shore of Galilee, maybe with the cool breeze coming over the water and the waves, carrying the voice of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth Himself as He taught the Master Teacher. We know uh, there are the content of other lessons were given, other sermons that He preached and taught. Uh, we don't know the content of this one necessarily. It's not specified by Luke here. But what a message that must have been to listen to the Lord Jesus teach. John reminds us that there are many things that he taught, that if it was all written down, there wouldn't be books enough to contain it all. This probably fits in one of those categories. The ones that the Holy Spirit wanted us to have forever are recorded in Scripture, and what a wonderful thing that is, that the Holy Spirit illuminated that and guided the disciples to pen these 27 books of the New Testament, four of those being the gospel accounts of the life and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I never get tired of reading the Gospels. I read them over and over, and I spend a lot of time reading the Gospels. And you should too, because they tell us so much about Jesus. When He had left speaking, He said unto Simon. Yeah, that Simon. The one that He had surnamed Peter. He said unto Simon, launch out into the deep. So they're a little way from the shore. He says, go out into the deep water. Let down your nets for a draught. And this is one of the reasons I love the King James Bible, the authorized version, because it says nets plural, and, and uh, it specifies that Peter says, I'll let down the net singular, and, and I think that's a good textual rendering. Uh, so pay attention to those small details. They do matter. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets. Uh, now don't forget this. Sometimes it's easy to read and just get in autopilot and forget that Y's are plural and T's are singular. Your plural, your nets, all of them, every net you have available to you, let them down. Not thy net, singular, your nets, plural. Both boats, you better get into this. Well, they're going to be in, in, in it together by the end of it all, but Peter is a little hesitant at first. And so this is why I point out to us, in this call to discipleship, Peter's, uh, Peter's first encounter, we meet him in partial obedience. He doesn't completely deny what the Lord is saying, but he only goes so far. And we see his partial obedience. Simon, yes, that Simon, the one he surnamed Peter, said unto him, Jesus, Master. 
And we, we talked about the difference between master and Lord. By the end of this passage, Peter is going to be calling him Lord. But here he says, you're the one that's presiding over this whole event here this morning. You've commandeered my ship. You asked me to do so, and I gave you permission to. But you're the one that's, uh, that, that is the master of these events. You're the one that's telling me to launch out into the deep. You're the one that's saying this, uh, master. You're the one standing over what's happening. Literally is kind of the sense of the word there, master. One who stands over. We have toiled all the night. We point out the difference between toil and work. Toiled all the night. And why is it toil and not work? Because Peter says, Simon says, we have taken nothing. I think maybe there's a little bit of frustration there on Peter's part. You know, Simon says, man, I've been fishing all night and I come home empty handed. I got nothing to feed my family. I've got nothing to turn in to, 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 to exchange uh, for business. Uh, you know, we're just, we're just kind of going through the motions right here. He says, we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net, singular. So he says, I'll put one in. I'll at least uh, go that far, and we'll put a net in. And I appreciated Brother Josh last week uh, reminding us that the, the kind of catch they brought in would be enough that they could go uh, take that to bank <laughs> by the time they're done with this day. And yet uh, Peter is about to see the Lord do something amazing. He says, we've taken nothing, and I love this phrase. Maybe you want to highlight it. Nevertheless, at thy word, at thy word. Isn't that beautiful? So this is Peter responding to the word of Jesus. And this is, this is special because Peter in John chapter number six is going to say, Lord, to whom shall we go? When, when all the other disciples go away except for the twelve, and one of those is a betrayer, uh, Jesus is going to ask them, will you go away also? And Peter, what does he say? He says, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will Let down the net. The net. Partial obedience. Jesus said nets. Peter said, I'll put down a net. And when they had this done, notice it's plural, they. They had this done. Maybe that's uh, Andrew. He's not named here, but I would guess that he's probably helping Peter in some capacity. They're brothers. And James and John, maybe there's other hands there. I don't know. Uh, We're not given those details. When they had this done... They enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. There are different means of fishing in this day. You can cast nets, you can drop hooks. Uh, we know there's another account where Peter is told to put down a hook, not a net, and uh, that's to pay the, the, the tribute <laughs> tax. And he finds uh, the miraculously just enough for him and Jesus in that fish's mouth. Hey, how'd you like to catch that fish? You know, catch a fish that's got money in it already, and then you go turn the fish in for money or eat it for lunch. I don't know. But... Uh, You can put down a hook. You can uh, put down a a net that you would cast, right? You throw this net out and it it encloses those fish. That's the kind of net I think they were using this night. There's also another net that Jesus uh, taught much about called the drag net. And you would put weights at the bottom of this net, almost make it like a wall where the fish would go into this. And you drag, literally drag that uh, across the bottom of the shore and try to catch these fish that way. So they had uh, various means of fishing, and Peter lets down this one net. He's going to try it out. They enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Now, a great multitude here, Luke tells us, uh, he doesn't give us the number, but John 21, we know that there was a number. It was 153 fishes. Thank you, Brother Josh. He covered that last week, come and dine. And uh, here we don't know how many, but it is a great multitude, so much that their net break. And I can just imagine the scene, those fish tearing through, shredding through that net. Oh, no, this is my livelihood. These are the tools of my trade, and I'm about to lose the tool of my trade and have to repair that or go get a new one. They beckoned unto their partners. We know that's James and John from the context and maybe others, that they should come help them. Boy, you should have listened to Jesus first off. And they came and filled both the ships so that they, plural, both of those ships began to sink. So we know Peter was a fisherman as we think about his partial obedience here. His faith was weak, but his heart and his hands were willing. His faith was a little weak here. And, and, and I can say that, I think, with good precedent because often through uh, the encounters we have, we're told about with Jesus and the disciples, we see uh, Jesus saying to them many times, O oh, ye of little faith, O oh, ye of little faith, where's your faith? 
Where's your faith? And, and at one time he says unto them, how is it that ye have no faith? Little faith, where is your faith? No faith, partial obedience can probably trace to a lack of faith somewhere. If we just believed the Lord like, like we should, and when he says put down the nets, we ought to just put down the nets, amen? We ought to just take him at his word and say, gather everything we can. But Peter's he, he's partially there. He says, okay, I've got a little faith. He's got some willing hands and his heart's ready. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will. If you're going to be a fisherman, you're going to have to be a strong person. This isn't for the weak at heart. You're going to need some strength. You're going to need some resilience. When you toil all night and take nothing, and you're going to get up and do it again the next day until you do catch something, you're going to be a resilient kind of person. You're going to have to have the ability to endure harsh conditions. The weather can change on the Lake of uh, Galilee at this time uh, just on a whim. Within half an hour, perhaps, at times, the wind comes through the way the lay of the land is, and you, you can have the water churned up. It can be dangerous. We know that because there was a time when these seasoned fishermen were fearful of their lives. When the storm came upon them, they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. So you had to be uh, familiar with your environment. You had to be resilient. You had to be. You had to have some strengths and some qualities. And I think as Jesus is calling Peter here, though he has weak faith, uh, he looks at Simon and he says, that's somebody that I can take them from where they are and I can help them become who God wants them to be, to go on and do great things. So there are some qualities that, uh, that Simon has that Jesus notices. His heart is willing, his faith is weak, his hands are ready. And uh, there was another person that, that pointed out uh, G Peter's response to the command, despite uh, his limited faith, shows that we have a need today to obey the Lord. And this is what that other preacher pointed out, that uh, even when we might not yet fully understand, Jesus gives us something to do, and we can't see the end from the beginning. Had Peter known that when he put that net down, that it was, about, it was going to break, I guarantee you he wouldn't have done it that way. He probably would have prepared a little better had he seen the end from the beginning. We've just got to take Jesus at His word. We may not be able to see everything that He sees, but can we trust Him? When He tells us promises about heaven, when He tells us promises about His Father's house, when He tells us uh, promises about being with us in every direction, when He tells us that we're going to be empowered to be His witnesses, when He gives us these things, when He, when he tells us in the Scriptures and other apostles and writers of the New Testament tell us that if we'll walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we have the promises of the fruit of the Spirit in our life, we may not be able to see everything that that entails. But trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, as that song says, and I know He holds my hand. We can trust. Our faith might be weak. Our heart needs to be willing, and our hands need to be ready to do what Jesus tells us to do. And we need to obey the Lord even when we might not yet fully understand. Peter is willing. He's, he's willing to go so far. He's willing to let down a net despite his initial reluctance. This is an act of faith. There is some faith there. One commentator observed uh, the term that Jesus uh, is told uh, here in Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 12. It says, he, he prayed all night. And they zero it in on this term back in verse number 12. The emphasis that, that is on prayer is what sets the stage for Jesus to call His disciples, to, to call them to Him and then to choose. He didn't do this lightly. You see, this isn't as illogical as Peter might think. It doesn't make sense. We've toiled all the night back in chapter 5. You see, Jesus doesn't do things without good precedent for it. And before He called His disciples and chose the apostles out of that number, He spent the whole night in prayer. If He did that for that, then 
I'm sure he knew exactly where the fish were swimming around that lake. They were right where Jesus needed them to be. And, and this was a confirmation, by the way, of the identity of the Lord. We see it in Luke 5, but then we also see it in John 21. How is it that Peter <laughs> knew that it was the Lord? Well, John told him. Well, how did John know? Well, John uh, noticed what happened when Jesus said, cast your net on the other side. Well, this is a little familiar. We've seen this happen before. It, they were able to identify that this was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ simply by this, this occurrence of the fish. So Peter is going to be on a journey from little faith to uh, maybe, maybe hesitant here, reluctant, and he's going to move into leadership later on after he's converted. Now, he's still got a ways to go before we get there, but how difficult is it for us to maintain a spiritual posture like Jesus did? Jesus spent all night in prayer before he made one of the biggest decisions in his entire ministry. And how easy for, is it for us to get distracted? Big choices, big choices, little choices. Doesn't matter the choice. We need to be spiritually in communion with the Lord. And this choosing back in uh, chapter 6, verse number 13, this is deliberate. This is, this is the sovereign selection by Jesus Christ of uh, what the New Testament refers to often as the twelve. The twelve. Now we know there's only going to be eleven that stick until Matthias replaces Judas Iscariot, but that's how they're known. They're known as the twelve. Out of all the disciples, these twelve will become the apostles alongside the Lord. For Peter to be included in that number was no accident. Go back to chapter number five. Why would Jesus select out of the two boats that were before him Simon's boat? Why would it be that boat that he would launch out from the shore a little bit? Why would it be that vessel that he would say, hey, let down your nets, get everybody together. Peter, your boat's going to be at the helm of this, and you're going to have others that you'll need help from. Why that boat? Why that ship? Why Simon? Because he did it on purpose. God chooses us despite our imperfections because he alone can change us and I, I warned you some weeks ago that you're going to hear the word transform a lot through these weeks because this is what Jesus does. This is what God does for our lives, the transformative power of the gospel. And Brother Josh Monitor didn't disappoint, disappoint us last week, did he? If you were listening, he used that word transformation. And I was paying close attention to that. He takes us from where we are to change us into uh, someone we can be for His honor and His glory. So here is Peter. He has partial obedience. We know what his trade was. He was a fisherman by trade. He had uh, a weak faith when he first met the Lord. Maybe we could say that, but his heart was willing. His, his hands were ready. And verse number 8 is uh, Peter's penitent recognition. After all of this happens, Peter comes before the Lord, and when he saw it, Luke 5, 8, he fell down at Jesus' knees in a posture of worship, mind you. He knows who Jesus is by now, and he says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Master? One who's providing, presiding over the events of the morning? Master? No, this is the Lord. The Lord of the fish, the Lord of the lake of Galilee, the Lord of the, the morning, the Lord of creation, the Lord of the universe. He's Lord. And Peter has a response here that looks a lot like others in Scripture. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What conviction! in the presence of divine power, in the presence of the Son of Man, who is the Son of God, in the presence of Jesus Himself. John R. Rice pointed out that Peter's humility in recognizing his unworthiness set the stage for his transformation. In order for Peter to be who God wants him to be, he has to acknowledge this. He has to come by contrition. 
And uh, he has this moment where his faith is weak, and he says, well, we've taken nothing all night. We've toiled, and, and uh, nevertheless at thy word. He, he only let down one net, but still God showed his power through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think Peter would ever forget this lesson in faith and obedience. Read his epistles, and I think you'll find it the case that he remembered this lesson in faith and obedience. Now, he's, he's got a lot to go through yet. We understand that. He's going to deny the Lord and be restored, and he'll be converted. But it is to whom, it is to Peter that Jesus said, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What a lesson. True discipleship begins with acknowledging our own inadequacy in light of God's abundant sufficiency. I am inadequate. He is all sufficient. Can we acknowledge our own inadequacies? Every day I'm a little more tuned in to how inadequate I am, how far short I fall in my own human finite thinking, strength, wisdom. I don't have much other than what God's Word gives me. I'm a mess. I'm a mess without the Lord. If it weren't for the Holy Spirit leading and guiding me, (laughs) where would I be today? I just, I must have Him. I can't move forward without Him. We cannot rely solely on our own abilities. Peter, you told all night and you took nothing. You can't do this in your own strength. You've got to have the power of the Lord. Peter, that was a night where you might chalk it up as, well, that's a failed night of fishing. The task seems overwhelming at times. You know, once God's provision did show up, what are they going to do now? They didn't staff things properly. They weren't ready to receive His blessings. And things began to break because of the abundance of God. That's a good problem to have, but it's a problem because they weren't ready to receive the abundance that He gave. We have to learn to lean into God's grace, into His strength, not our own efforts. And Peter is uh, very intimately aware of his own limitations, is he not? Can we admit our need for God in every area of our lives? Some of us are very capable, very smart. Most of you are smarter than me. And uh, there are some folks in this room and maybe folks watching that you're very capable. And you could do a lot, but in practical terms, do we seek God's guidance before we make huge decisions, before we make little decisions? Do we trust His plans, even when it seems to run counterintuitive to our own plans? Well, I don't know how this is going to make sense, but, but we're going to trust the Lord because the guidance of His Word shows us the path forward. That will be a path that leads to peace. The knowledge of who Jesus is. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior. Who said those words? Peter did. God's strength, remember, is made perfect in our weaknesses. So where we're the weakest, that's where God can show His strength the most. Another uh, writer noted this, uh, Peter's brokenness, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And, And he rightfully referenced a verse that came to my mind in Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 5. This passage where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. This was Isaiah's response. Then said I, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. Does he sound a little bit like Peter? I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I don't know about you, but the last time I uh, was around this kind of environment, uh, the people weren't the uh, the best talkers. Now, I don't know if this was the kind of language that Peter espoused regularly. I tend to believe that he could be a potty mouth when provoked. If you look at him warming by the fire, uh, he began to curse. And I don't know if that was uh, actually foul language or profanities that he was saying, or if it was him uh, just denying the Lord altogether. Some There's different takes on that. But uh, fishermen don't have the best tongues at times, do they? Maybe some of them can watch their mouth better than others. But here is Isaiah, and he says, I I mean, Isaiah, it's one thing to talk about men engaged in the trade of fishing, 
being potty mouths. But here is, here is a man of God. Here is God's prophet, Isaiah, a minister to the king of Israel. He was serving under Uzziah when Uzziah died. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And Isaiah himself said, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I used to work a job that every day I got around people with potty mouths. And, uh, and, and it's pretty, it grates on you over time. And thankfully, you know, there were times when I had an intercom that we would talk to each other through, and there was a wall, and it was sound, pretty soundproof. You know, they had to really yell in order for me to hear them through that, through that uh, bulletproof glass. But I had an intercom that we could push the button and talk to each other when we needed to, and there were some drivers that I had that I would just turn that thing off. And if they needed me, they could bang on the glass because, well, I mean... Before we come down too hard on them, they are driving around Denver, but still, I didn't want to listen to that mess. And, and I, I'm not about to try to correct them, okay? Uh, they're grown men. They know what they're doing. And if I, if I don't have to listen to it, I'm not going to listen to it. And, and so I would just turn it off. I did have some of them over time come and apologize to me. I never confronted them blatantly on it. But I could tell, you know, when, when they would say things or slip up and and then they would know that I go to church and I was a deacon in the church at the time and, and I was trying to serve the Lord and, and they never heard that kind of stuff come from me and I just kind of lived differently. I was a witness before them and uh, they saw, you know, maybe, I don't know, they would probably glance back and see me reading my New Testament at times when I didn't have anything else going on and I could read the Scriptures. They, they would probably just observe things about me and that's not to say that I'm anything. But they would come and apologize and say, you know what, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to do better. I'm, I'm going to watch my tongue. I'm going to watch my mouth. I'm, an un, I, 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 I'm an, a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I, th I think the Holy Spirit might have been convicting them a little bit that, like Peter, they would say, I'm not worthy to be in your presence, Lord. And, and I would remind them, hey, I'm nothing. So when they would apologize to me, I would just simply say, well, I appreciate that, but these aren't virgin ears. Uh, it's not me that you need to apologize to. And I would leave it right there. And they got the point. You need to say sorry to Him. You need to understand that there is a holy God who's going to hold you accountable for every idle word, let alone this trashy stuff that's coming out of your mouth that you ought not to be saying and speaking. And so the Spirit of God might have been tugging on their heart. And I'm thankful for those that the Lord allowed me to lead to Him through that course, but just an illustration. You know, Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And what brought this contrast? Like Peter on the shore of Galilee, Isaiah said, uh, here, mine eyes have seen the King. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Jehovah of armies. Now this is a man who knew what armies were, who knew what kings were, who knew what lords should be in Israel in that day and time. And he says, I am in the presence of someone so much greater than Uzziah was. I am in the presence of so much, someone so much greater than I am. Peter acknowledged who he was in the presence of, and he says, I'm not worthy to be here. Probably some regret. After encountering God, Job declared this in Job 42, verses 5 and 6, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth, mine eye seeth thee. And what does Job say in the next verse? Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes, broken. The call that comes to Peter. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That call was attended by Peter's humility. The Apostle Paul refers to himself uh, in a similar way, and this is the man who met the, the Lord on the road to Damascus. Here he is. He's got letters to persecute Christians. He's zealous for God. He thinks he's, he's upholding you know, the, the tenets of Judaism and, and the Jewish faith, and he thinks he's doing the right thing, and the Lord meets him on the road to Damascus. It says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He was like a bull in a china shop, just going about with his own zeal. And he had a zeal, but it was without knowledge. He didn't know that he was hurting the Lord Jesus Christ in the cause of the disciples and the apostles, the cause of the early church. And the Lord stopped him on the road to Damascus and allowed him to proceed no further. This would be the very man, mind you, that the Lord would raise up some 14 years after that to be the apostle to the Gentiles, one born out of due time. And I can imagine the humbling experience that Saul had on the road to Damascus when he was blinded and that voice came and he had to acknowledge who he was in light of who he was in the presence of. And uh, the words out of his mouth were, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I can imply from that maybe some brokenness and some uh, remorse and regret like, oh no, what, did, what have I done? What have I done? I have letters in my hand to arrest well-meaning Christians who are just trying to live for you. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, there was some things that led up to that. Remember, it was Stephen that was put to death, and, and Saul presided over that. And he saw the testimony. He heard the testimony of Stephen. And, and so the Lord had prepared him to meet him on the road to Damascus. But this is what he told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. Thank you, Paul, for taking that title, because I don't think anyone can, can argue with that, him being the chiefest of sinners. And yet, if he's the chief, i got to be right up there with him somewhere. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. True discipleship begins with acknowledging our own inadequacy in light of God's abundant sufficiency. Peter, you just should have listened to the Lord. Overwhelming awareness. Isaiah 57, 15 is a great verse to jot down. It reminds us, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, just ponder that. Let it blow your mind. This isn't just anyone we're talking about. This is the one who inhabits eternity. Don't ask me exactly what that means. I can only explain to you in theological terms what that means. I, I really can't know the full extent of it. And I can't even explain the theology behind it that well sometimes. He inhabited eternity. I've never been there yet. I'm on my way there <laughs> through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and if you don't have Him, you will spend eternity somewhere forever. This is where God dwells. He dwells in that place that is beyond this life, that is beyond any comprehension we have. He is transcendent, so high above creation. He is the high and lofty one. He is described as the most high. He is uh, known, as the, known to the pagans as the God of heaven. There, there's all these lowercase g gods that they would serve. But this was the God of heaven that all served, and none could attain to this kind of highness. This is the Almighty, the El Shaddai. This is the one who inhabits eternity. Whose name is holy. Now, uh, that's a verbless clause in the original. So the emphasis is on the character trait that we see. Whose name holy. And what did the high priest have inscribed on his mitre? Holiness unto the Lord. What did the seraphim that Isaiah described back in chapter 6 say as they circled the throne of God? Holy, holy, holy. And we sing, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. This is who we talk about. I dwell in the high and holy place. With Him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. You want to live where where God lives, you want to dwell where God dwells, God says, I dwell with those who are able to abase themselves. He visits those who understand that they're nothing in light of Him being everything. And this is where Peter's at. So he's right in the place where God is getting ready to use him. He says, I dwell with Him. I dwell in this high and holy place. And you think of other Psalms, maybe that say, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? 
He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Psalm 24 would be another one along with Psalm 15. How do we get into this place? Well, you can't come lofty. You can't come in your own strength. You can't come thinking that you've got it figured all out. Now, we've told all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, it doesn't make sense to me. Nevertheless, at thy word, Peter said. Peter was humble. And he met the Lord here, and I believe he felt the reviving of the Spirit that Isaiah described. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. How's your heart today? Is it lifted up? Or is it contrite? Do you come in contrition before the Lord and say, I am nothing and you are everything? Do you have the heart of a John the Baptist that would say, I must decrease and he must increase? And if that's where you are, then I can tell you, uh, you're living where the Lord lives. You're going to have his blessing attend to you. You're going to have a revival in your spirit because you're learning to lean into him instead of into the arm of flesh, which will fail you. We lean into His everlasting arm. And this is where we see Peter's purpose becomes reimagined. So His partial obedience in verses 1 through 7 of Luke 5, His penitent recognition in verse 8, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And then His purpose becomes reimagined in verses 10 and 11. Back in Luke 5, we learn in verse 10 that uh, so also was also James and John. They were there with him, the sons of Zebedee. They were partners with Simon. With who? With Simon. With that Simon. The Simon he surnamed Peter. That one. And Jesus said unto Simon, listen to these words, fear not. Peter had just said, depart from me. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And the Lord comes and says, fear not. It's okay, Peter. I'm not going to strike you with lightning like Zeus. I'm not going to roast you in my presence. He says, you, you don't have to be fearful. Now, here is God manifest in the flesh who had taken on the form of a servant and He comes and in the likeness of sinful flesh, and says, Peter, I know where you live. I know where you dwell. I, I, I feel the temptations. I sense them. He'd just come through the temptation in the wilderness, being tempted of the devil 40 days. And yet he did all of that without sin. And he says, Peter, I'm, I'm here for you. I've come to you. I, I came to your boat today, Peter. I, I, I told you to let down your nets today, Peter. I came to you. You don't have to be fearful in my presence. Peter found the Lord because the Lord had found him. It's like Jeremiah says, turn us and we shall be turned. I can't explain all that that means to you, but I do know that there's a ditch on both sides, whether you err on the side of Calvinism or on the side of free will alone and ignore the sovereignty of God. There is a balance in Scripture. And so the Lord finds Peter, and, and Peter finds him. Turn us, and we shall be turned, O Lord. And Peter had a will to exert of his own. He could have said no to the Lord. He, he could have gone his own way. He could have taken, as Brother Josh pointed out last week, he could have taken that big catch and gone to bank and probably done pretty well for a while until it runs out. But Peter gets a new purpose. He says, fear not. From henceforth, in other words, from this time forward, this day, this, this fateful morning, you're going to catch men. You're not going to be in this uh, trade of catching fish. You're going to be catching men. Thou shalt catch men. Peter, you singular, you're going to catch men. And when they, plural, had brought their ships to land, Peter, probably right there in front of them all, said... We're doing it. What does it say? They forsook all and followed him. I wonder what kind of impact Peter had on James and John and Andrew. Now, we've got to say some things about Andrew, but I don't have time this morning. This is a new mission. He, Peter moves from a fisherman to a fisher of men. 
And this is going to become an eternal work. Not just a temporal work where you're going to catch and feed your family for a day, for a week, for a month. No, this is going to be an eternal endeavor. You're going to be bringing souls to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be catching them for all eternity. And they will be forever sealed once they're saved. It's an eternal work. And it's powerful. Fishing, again, uh, as I mentioned, has different ways that it could be done. And Jesus used, uh, used fishing often when He taught. One of those is in the parable of the dragnet that I mentioned in Matthew 13. There's an element tied to this fishing for men that also would symbolize judgment. And while it's one thing to think about being caught up into the net of the gospel and how wonderful it is to be saved and all the promises of heaven, and hey, do you know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know that for sure? If you don't, you need to get that settled. Because while that's wonderful to think about the positive promises of the Word of God in my Father's house are many mansions and and the wonderful blessings of the fullness of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and the, the things we have that are so positive about the Christian life, let us never forget that there will be a judgment to come. The Puritans had this down well. There is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Peter, you're going to be a fisher of men because uh, there's going to come a time when that net is dragged in and we're going to have a discerning between the good fish and the bad fish. You know, that's what they would do in this dragnet. They would drag those fish in and you'd have some that were edible and some that weren't. Some that could be used for these purposes and others that could be used for different purposes. Some of them just weren't even fit to keep, frankly. Eels and those kind of things, maybe you could think about what could get caught up in a dragnet. Some of those fish, you know, we used to do this when I fished, and and I wasn't a seasoned fisherman, but I remember going to lakes and stuff in Georgia growing up, and before I had to, before I I got too old and had to get a fishing license, we'd just go out there with our fishing poles, and we'd get a little boat, and we'd go out and sit and and fish, and we'd catch catfish, and I never liked to eat catfish too much, but, you know, pretty much what we caught uh, catfish with was liver, and that's about what what liver is good for, catfishing, but uh, some of you like liver and onions, and and that's great. Uh, I'm glad that you like that, but it's a little too much iron for me. <laughs> and so we'd use liver to catch catfish. We, we'd catch brim and crappie, and we'd have some other fish. And, you know, we didn't want to waste it. You know, we're just having fun fishing, right? But we wanted to help others, and so we'd go clean out the, the, the fishing hole, and we'd catch all this brim and, and uh, other things, and we'd have, us, we'd have some crappie. We'd have some catfish. We'd have some bass if we got really fortunate that day. And we'd, we'd put it all in a, in a cooler and we'd take it up to the, to, the, um, to the trailer park up the street. And man, they would just fall over themselves to get our catch for that day. We'd have a big catch and we'd come. They'd freeze that and live on it for six months, man. They'd put that in the freezer and they'd have some good fish. And, and they were thankful, you know, when they saw me and my stepbrother coming in with a nice catch in our hands. And, and so they'd take care of it. And, you know, we, we had the fun part. We got to do all the catching and they got to do all the cleaning. And, and then they got to do all the eating too. But there were some fish that we'd catch that I wouldn't eat them. You know, carp? I, I don't know. I never cared for carp. <laughs> and uh, there were other people that, that could make really good things out of carp. And so we would go give them all of our carp because we weren't going to eat those carp. Jesus, one day, will sit as the judge over all humanity. There will be a great harvest. There will be a dragnet that comes in. And in Matthew 25, he talks about um, a, a different type of animal, mind you, but he, he talks about that, that sense of judgment. And one day, the Lord Jesus Himself will divide between the sheep and the goats. And, and there will be those that on the right hand will be able to enter into life and peace and joy. And on the other hand, there will be those that will be uh, sent for destruction. And there will be a great sifting. As a fisherman, Peter would be well aware of that, so let's not miss this uh, this idea that with with him being a fisher of men, the reason it's so important that we put that gospel net down and put that gospel net down, and never hesitate to ask folks, "Are you sure that if you died today, that heaven would be your home?" is because implied in that is that yes, there's a heaven to gain, but there's a hell to shun, 
And there's a hell to avoid. And that hell is very real, and it's for all eternity. And this urgency ought to move us as fishers of men to do a little more than I think we do sometimes. To, to never hesitate to draw people to that question, what will you do with Jesus? What are you seeking for your eternal destiny? Have you considered your soul? You will spend eternity somewhere forever. And there's a kingdom that Jesus is going to bring to this earth, and He wants you to be a part of it. And if you'll get saved in, in Jesus Christ by faith, you can have a part of that and be, uh, be rescued from sin. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Think about uh, the infections we get sometimes of having little faith and no faith. How's your faith today as I draw our time here to a close? Are you infected with little faith like Peter? Are you uh, only partially obedient to the Lord? Or are you sold out? Could there be one here today that's in the position of having no faith at all in who the Lord Jesus Christ is? If you were to tell me that that was you, I could understand why. Given the state of affairs of, of how Christendom is today, there's confusion on every hand. There's, there's uh, so many excuses we might have as to why we haven't considered Christ more. But I hope that I've challenged you to look at the, the authority of the Scriptures today and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, because this is not a fictitious story, friend. This is a real man, Jesus of Nazareth, who really stood before another fisherman named Simon, used his boat to teach great lessons, but even, even beyond that, he taught Peter this day about his power over creation. And one day, if you don't settle your soul's eternal destiny before the Lord Jesus Christ, you will meet your faith. Well, having a little faith is better than no faith, and just even the smallest amount of faith is enough to get you into heaven. We don't deny that. I'm here to tell you today that wherever you're at in that spectrum, God doesn't want you to have little faith. He certainly doesn't want you to have no faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God wants you to leave here today with great faith. With great faith. Peter is going to leave that day with great faith. Because he had seen the Lord do this with temporal things, with, uh, with material fish, and Jesus had promised, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Peter's going to go and follow the Lord with great faith. Now, it'll waver at times, and he'll have to be corrected, mind you, but that faith is going to lead him to stand up before 3,000 one day and preach the gospel and see them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thou shalt catch men. God wants you to have great faith. In order to do that, we recognize our limitations, and we see the tension between our own frailty and God's omnipotence. And uh, sometimes we might come in partial obedience, limited faith, because we're struggling legitimately. We, we can struggle like Peter did. We feel inadequate. We feel uncertain. But unless we grasp our own limitations and our own weaknesses, we'll never be ready to take that first step Really, uh, I would say it's his second step uh, here in, in his growth to be what God wants us to be. We're very aware of our shortcomings. And I want to uh, invite us today to consider in light of how far short we fall. Think about how much greater our God is than our weakness. God will have grace for you. And so we're going to close our service here with an invitation like we do in our church. And I'll ask the pianist to come and play a verse where we can pray and seek the Lord and talk to God. What has the Lord spoken to you about through His Word today, through Peter's journey? Where is it in your life that you need God's grace? It's abundant, but it comes to those who are contrite. Can you humble yourself before the Lord today like Peter did and acknowledge Him? and let His grace visit you so that you can leave here today with that same peace that Peter had when he heard those words, Fear not.